Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our fifth Canadian Cattle Producers Virtual Town Hall. Welcome, everyone. Merci de vous joindre à notre cinquième assemblée publique de l'industrie bovine canadienne et bienvenue à tous. My name is Michelle McMullen, and I'm the Communications Manager for the Canadian Cattlemen's Association. Je m'appelle Michelle McMullen, et je suis directrice des communications à l'Association canadienne des éleveurs de bovins. Before we begin tonight's event, I'd like to offer a couple of tips to make your viewing experience more pleasant. There are three viewing options available to you tonight, active speaker, gallery, and mini. To change the view layout on your screen, please click the view options button at the top of the Zoom screen. We have a number of informative updates lined up this evening. Before we get to those updates, I'll pass it over to Bob Lowe, President of the Canadian Cattlemen's Association, and Michelle Daig, Chair of the National Cattle Feeders Association, for short remarks to open tonight's meeting. With that, I'll give the floor to Bob and Michelle. Okay, hey, thanks, Michelle. And welcome, everybody. It's been a while since we've had a town hall, and we've got quite a bit to record on, so with no further ado, we'll get started. Um, to begin with, I'd like to acknowledge the support and the contributions of our provincial member associations and natural, national partners during these times. I think COVID has really brought the industry together. Um, we, we appreciate and we needed the collaboration and the input of everybody on the policy files and the sharing of information with government. It was, it was well received by government and I think well received by producers across the country. CCA also partnered with the Canadian Federation of Agriculture on their Food for Thought campaign. The aim of the campaign was twofold. One, to raise public awareness of the risks of the Canadian, risk facing Canadian farmers due to COVID and mobilize these agriculture advocates in a letter writing campaign intended to raise the profile of agriculture in Ottawa. Results from phase one of the campaign there was 52,000 emails to local MPs and ministers, Bebo, Freeland, and Morneau. 92% of the letters came from urban or suburban centers. Overall, a success in demonstrating strong support for Canadian farmers in popu populations largely disconnected from agriculture. This, uh, our public and stakeholder engagement group also initiated a consumer research study. The findings of this, most Canadians have a positive impression, impression of the industry. The industry is well regarded as one that produces a high quality product and has positive economic contributions for our country and communities. While the impressions are largely positive, can Canadians are less certain about industry efforts to limit environmental impacts. This to me is an easy thing to get around. We have the science that shows how, how cattle and the environment are, go hand in hand. So th this is going to be an easy one in my mind to, to make people feel better about it. And actually 68% feel better about the industry after learning about its commitment to the environmental footprint. We've initiated a cow-calf cost of production project. It was launched at the CBIC in August. It will, it will host 26 cow-calf producer focus groups across Canada to establish baseline cost of production statistics and develop future farm scenarios. This project will provide benchmarking data for cow-calf producers in every province that are specific to production systems and ecoregions. We're actively recruiting participants for these focus groups over the next several months, and we would encourage you to sign up. If you're interested in this initiative, please sign up at www.camfax.ca. Our beef industry goals. In today's speech from the throne, we were pleased to see the government acknowledge the role that farmers and ranchers across Canada play in the fight against climate change. We look forward to continuing to the, engage the government on this important topic during the fall session. 
Building upon our five-year goals that were outlined in the 2020-2024 National Beef Strategy, Canada's beef industry now has now identified a suite of ambitious 10-year goals that will provide positive and clear messaging about the desire to continually improve practices, reduce carbon footprint, and enhance the natural environments. This demonstrates our commitment to ensuring the health and viability of both our land and animals. Building public trust is based on doing the right things for the land, the animals, and the environment, and is precisely what these goals are meant to demonstrate. First three topics were announced at the Canadian Roundtable for Sustainable Beefs AGM. Greenhouse gas and carbon sequestration, animal health and welfare, and land use and biodiversity. In the spring of 2021, another four topics will be addressed, including water, beef quality and food safety, human health and safety, and technology. To learn about these goals, visit www.beefstrategy.com. And I'm sure that Amy will have this up somewhere. Just to, before I turn things over to Michelle, I'd like to just mention uh, this is the fall run and cattle sales. And as beef producers in Canada, we need to do our part to ensure that we don't have a, yet more of an economic meltdown. So I would encourage everybody to remain vigilant about face masks and social distancing. Uh, we, the, the country can't stand any more of an economic shutdown. So we need to do our part to make sure that that doesn't happen. Um, Michelle, I'll turn it over to you with that. Yes, thank you, Bob. Good evening, everyone. My name is Michel Deg, Chair of the National Cattle Feeder Association. It has been a busy spring and summer, both for us as producers and as industry organization in navigating the political and social landscape that seem to change daily. Our governments have been receptive and willing to work with our cattle feeders to ensure we have options available for as many producers as possible. Myself and our CEO, Janice Strandberg, have presented to the standing committee twice over the summer, sharing the needs of cattle feeders and the beef industry as a whole. We have also had the opportunity to present to the Liberal Pacific Caucus to discuss BRM program and COVID impacts on our producers. As some of the restriction ease, and we were able to have distance meeting, we hosted a few members of parliament of our feedlot on our feedlot across Canada. Thank you to my MP Simon Pierre Savard Tremblay for being among those to take the time to understand the issues facing our beef producers. Thanks to MP McLeod for taking the time in BC with Joe Imskirk, uh, the uh, board director. And uh, thanks special to MP Shields who visit the James Beckwing Fieldlot in Alberta with the same purpose. We continue to work with uh, our government and other Canadian beef organization on your behalf. Please don't hesitate to ask questions and contact your National Cattle Feeder Association board members if you need some help. Now, a few words in French. On m'a demandé de faire une courte présentation en français. Alors, euh, je suis le président de l'Association nationale des engraisseurs de bovins. J'ai connu un printemps et un été très, très occupé aussi bien pour nous les producteurs que pour les organisations de l'industrie du bœuf, tant sur le plan politique que social, les données changeaient presque quotidiennement. Nos gouvernements ont montré de la réceptivité pour euh, la recherche de solutions pour l'ensemble des éleveurs. Au cours de l'été, à deux reprises, accompagnés de Janice Strandberg, nous avons fait deux présentations devant le comité permanent d'agriculture Ottawa afin de bien faire comprendre nos besoins tant comme éleveur de bovins que pour l'ensemble de l'industrie. Malgré les restrictions imposées par la fameuse COVID, nous avons été en mesure de tenir des rencontres à distance, heureusement. Nous avons même reçu à nos fermes quelques membres du Parlement, et ce, à travers le Canada. 
Merci à mon député Simon-Pierre Savard-Tremblay pour être un de ceux qui ont pris le temps de comprendre les préoccupations des producteurs de bœuf. La même merci pour le député McLeod de Colombie-Britannique et pour le député Shields de l'Alberta qui ont visité aussi des producteurs aussi bien en Alberta qu'en Colombie-Britannique. Nous continuons à travailler en collaboration avec les organisations actives dans l'industrie du bœuf pour améliorer le sort des producteurs de bovins. Alors, n'hésitez pas à communiquer avec vos membres de l'association de chacune des régions si vous avez besoin de plus d'éclaircissements. Alors, merci à vous, Mme Michel. Thank you, Bob and Michelle, for your remarks. Tonight, we will receive updates from Fawn Jackson, Director of Government and International Relations at CCA, Janice Tranberg, President and CEO of the National Cattle Feeders Association, Kim O'Neill, Director of Beef and Veal at the Canadian Meat Council, Brady Stadnicki, Manager of Policy and Programs at CCA, and Brian Perriott, Manager and Senior Analyst at Canfax. Following these updates, we will open the floor up to questions from producers. We will limit the duration of this entire presentation to one hour. Please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to submit your question. We would ask that you include your name and province with your question. Please be advised that we will not be taking questions using the chat function. I'll now turn the floor over to Fawn, Janice, Kim, Brady, and Brian. Perfect. Okay. Well, thank you so much, uh, Michelle, and I'm happy to be here to uh, give an update both on um, you know, what we've been working on over the last number of months uh, at CCA and then what we see coming down uh, the pipeline. So I uh, lead our Ottawa office and uh, both on international and government relations. And for those of us who are uh, politicos, today was, was a pretty big day. Uh, it was the speech from the throne, and uh, there, uh, of course, is always um, things to to comment on when when you see that coming out. So, um, you know what we what we heard in um, the speech from the throne, I think, did have a number of things that we've seen that the Liberals have been focusing on um, since their since their mandate uh, began. In terms of agriculture, I think some things that were quite interesting um, to hear perhaps that had been repeated but you know things that we we are happy to hear um, many of you i'm sure uh, right now might be struggling with uh, rural broadband internet and so uh, that is going to be a focus of the government and they've said that they are going to speed up because they know because of covid that um, that all canadians need to have access to that so you know that's something that we're uh, happy to hear uh, Bob mentioned that they also um, had said that they are going to recognize and work in partnership with farmers, foresters, and ranchers uh, on, on climate change. And, you know, I think that was something that we were happy to hear, too, that we uh, can work in partnership because we certainly are part of uh, the, the solution. Uh, we also heard that they're um, going to work on, on free trade. Uh, and through uh, the Ottawa group. And so the government of Canada has been pushing very hard to make sure that the World Trade Organization uh, can continue to be uh, effective um, at, through this Ottawa group. So we're happy to, happy to see that um, as well. Uh, they're going to leverage advantage, our, the Canadian advantage on immigration. And we uh, certainly know that within agriculture, we are always looking for more workers. And so that's uh, something that we've been pushing for a long time uh, at the CCA. So those are sort of, you know, positive things, but there are also things that sort of make you sit back and, and wonder what that's actually going to look like uh, when it's put into place. Uh, in their last budget, they had announced um, the water agency. So that was something that they repeated again, um, looking at, um, at uh, rebuilding some of the, um, the PHAC that uh, had previously existed. So, uh, or, um, PFRA, sorry, uh, that had previously uh, existed. So, you know, I think, what does that actually, what does that actually look like? Um, certainly also, um, um, they also mentioned irrigation infrastructure. So, you know, I think that has probably some opportunities for the beef industry, but might also have some, some risks uh, for us as, as well. So, you know, a throne speech is pretty high level. And I think that what we're um, going to see coming out of that is, is going to be the devil in the details in uh, the coming days. And certainly one of the devils in the details is going to be uh, whether 
this government is able to continue uh, operating because uh, there are votes of confidence coming coming forward. Um, the Conservatives have said very clearly that they will not be voting with the Liberal government, um, but the NDP have been, um, have said that they have a few priorities on uh, sick leave and continued benefits for Canadians um, that is important for them to be able to support this, this budget. The Bloc Québécois have hinted that they're not um, that they're probably not going to be, but I don't think that that's been uh, clearly stated yet. So certainly we're watching to see if there's going to be uh, an election um, or whether um, this, this Liberal government is able to, to carry on with its mandate. Um, government is again going to look different um, coming back this fall and doing um, online voting again. Uh, so our efforts in Ottawa also look different and perhaps uh, you have seen uh, on social media that we have been focusing very much on getting uh, members of parliament and senators out to, to farms. Um, and, you know, I think it goes back to 4-H and there's just really, truly nothing um, like, like seeing it and being there uh, and perhaps participating a, a very small amount um, for these members of parliament. Um, and so, you know, I think COVID has certainly brought challenges in how we communicate uh, to government, but it's also created uh, opportunity. Um, not too long ago, we submitted uh, our comments on what we would hope to see in a budget in this uh, upcoming a coming term. Um, certainly for our priorities, trade is always going to be um, you know, right up there in terms of, of priority. We um, particularly, Canada has been focusing on a transitional agreement with the United Kingdom. So as of January this year, uh, the Canada-UK or sorry, UK CETA, uh, they are, are leaving. And so uh, we are needing to, to negotiate a transitional agreement, uh, which we are hoping is going to lead into um, an agreement um, that is even more robust uh, than CETA and more meaningful than CETA, because certainly uh, Canada and Europe have uh, opportunity in trade, but there are certainly a number of challenges that we hope will be addressed uh, in the Canada-UK agreement. So we've been, we've been working on that. Um, we're also looking for CPTPP. So that's an agreement that we have with a number of, uh, of countries, uh, Japan being um, the key there um, for us in, in the beef world, uh, which has seen growth uh, into, into uh, a number of, into that market. Um, and, and so we're hoping to see that that trade pact can, can also see some growth. Um, perhaps through a number of other partners. We've been communicating uh, that. Uh, if I look at uh, the US, of course, <laughs> just recently we had the aluminum uh, situation that sort of uh, re-reared its, its, I don't know if it's an ugly head, but it's its head, uh, and livestock aluminum trailers were going to uh, be included in that, and so we were able to uh, communicate that, uh, our concerns with government, and uh, luckily uh, Canada and the US uh, have been able to, to find some paths forward there. That doesn't mean that it's going to go away uh, forever, and, and I think as we're heading into the US election that, um, that we might see some other things pop up, um, but certainly we have a number of really great allies down in the US, and so it's always good to have uh, those conversations and keep trade flowing in, in all directions. Um, certainly Asia is, uh, is a key market for us. So when we're looking at, um, you know, communicating with government, South Korea is somewhere where we would like to see um, some trade advancements, particularly on the technical side. Uh, and then, you know, you can't talk about uh, Asia without um, having a look at, at China. And that has been um, a strained relationship um, for some time now. And I'm sure that um, Kim is going to be able to talk about that a little bit um, later as well. Um, moving on from the trade file, uh, we're also working on animal health, of course. Um, one of our big asks there is around the foot and mouth um, disease vaccine bank. And what we would like to see is an investment by the Canadian government into FMD, because we know that if we had that, um, that, that disease come into Canada, that would really be a very detrimental. And so um, what we're asking is for 1.9 to 2.7 million doses um, because um, it has a 14-week um, vaccine production um, time frame, and so we need to make sure that we have these vaccines uh, ready to go um, should they be needed. 
Um, Brady is going to talk more about the business risk management side of things, um, but there is a federal provincial territorial meeting coming up in uh, November and we're certainly aiming at that date to, um, to have had conversations with the federal government, with all of the provinces in partnership with our provincial cattle organizations to communicate just how important business risk management is and correct tools. So when we look at the livestock price insurance and our producers in Eastern Canada don't even have access to that type of a program, you know, we, we really know that we need to make some, some serious progress there. Uh, so, you know, that's a, that's a timeline. And, you know, I think that um, we're making progress there, but it's certainly not uh, an, easy, an easy lift. Um, and we are hopeful um, that, that we're going to see some changes. Um, but of course, all provinces um, are, are having challenges with budget because of, of COVID-19. Um, but, you know, where I think the opportunity does lay is that uh, agriculture has been identified by EDC, so um, as one of the key Canadian um, sectors of the economy that is best able to survive uh, COVID-19. And, and, you know, I think that's for a, a number of reasons. Everybody needs to keep on eating, but we also have um, tools that are able, able to help us survive um, these sorts of challenges. And, you know, COVID, I think, shows where we need to make some really highlights where we need to make some of the improvements in these programs, but certainly drives home the point of why these programs are just so uh, integral to the well-being of, of the Canadian farming and ranching uh, communities. Um, you know, perhaps that's where I'm going to leave it, but I'd be really happy to answer uh, any questions um, at the end, and Michelle, I'll hand it back over to you. Thanks for that update, Fawn. We will uh, now have Janice Tranberg give her update on behalf of the National Cattle Feeders Association. Thanks so much, uh, Michelle and Fawn. You did a really great job of, of outlining uh, a lot of the things that are going on. Um, NCFA has been quite happy to be able to partner with, uh, with CCA on a number of these issues, uh, as well as um, through some of the submissions that we've been, that we've been making ourselves. You know, um, as Michelle mentioned, over the last few months, we've worked to connect federally with our partners uh, and with the government through calls, letters. Uh, we've reached out to many officials, including Minister Babo and both the Deputy Minister and the Assistant Deputy Minister uh, from Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, um, where we have fairly regular conversations and um, and as again, as Michelle mentioned, we invited several MPs out to visit our members' feedlots uh, for some firsthand discussions on, on some of our issues and programming solutions uh, and, and the future. Um, again, as Vaughn mentioned, it, it is a really good opportunity to be able to have these one-on-one -on -one visits. And with the with the uh, our government officials having more time, I think. We're, we're trying to uh, build on those opportunities. For example, the fall, we usually have our uh, Day on the Hill, the NCFA Day on the Hill, and we meet with many representatives um, during our annual lobby week. But this, will, this year, we've decided to take it virtually, and we've scheduled meetings with a significant number of uh, key decision makers in October. So uh, please look forward to that. Um, <clears throat> You know, we can, we can, we will continue to partner with CCA uh, and the other organizations, uh, but we've also been working on several regulatory challenges, um, particularly, you know, ensuring that US Canada remains, um, the border remains open and that there are no, no issues um, moving cattle to and from the US. Um, you know, the other thing is we, you know, normally we'd be able to connect with our members um, and have social gatherings. And as we know that we, you know, that hasn't been able to happen. So we've been conducting some small meetings across the province just to connect with our members uh, and to get their opinions and information going forward. Um, as well, we've created a several valuable resources to um, that are quite specific to feedlots to help to help them. And recently, we just put out a comprehensive 
feedlot best management practices guideline. And we worked quite closely with Alberta Health Services and Ag and Forestry um, to make sure that we've kept it up to date as possible. And we do encourage you uh, to, to take a look at that and follow those practices, particularly um, as the fall is coming and uh, we've seen a, a, a dramatic increase in the number of cases. Um, NCFA board also just completed a strategic planning session and we're looking forward to working with our members with renewed focus and uh, we just say reach out to your board representatives if you have any questions or concerns because we're here to work with you. So thank you. Thanks for your update Janice. We'll now turn it over to Kim O'Neill from um, the Canadian Meat Council for her update. Well, good evening, everyone. Thanks for inviting me to be part of this uh, this town hall. Um, I was asked to uh, give a bit of an update on uh, CMC's priorities and uh, some of the work that we've been doing uh, on behalf of the beef and veal industry. And I guess I'll just start with, uh, Swan spoke a lot about, uh, or some about some of the trade issues that, that, that she's been working on. And this is something that, that we, we work on together, a lot of these issues. And the Beef and Veal Committee of the Canadian Meat Council have, uh, have uh, identified what the key priorities are uh, for our members. And, and that's uh, in no particular order because everybody has their own markets and their own interests. But uh, as, as a, an industry, we've, uh, we've presented to, to the Market Access Secretariat what, what our priorities are. Um, the U.S., of course, is, uh, is our number one customer, um, but we, we still have some issues to resolve, as Juan was talking about. Uh, um, sometimes, specifically, there's some efficiencies that could be achieved on the border crossing process uh, with some testing delays that, that pop up from time to time. Um, China, um, that's uh, one that we've been working on for some time. Uh, beyond the, the recent issues, uh, we've, we're looking for access for bony and beef. Uh, we're looking for awful and we're looking for system approval for all eligible establishments because right now um, not all of our members have access uh, to that market. Uh, the EU, we're looking for uh, to get recognition for the use of antimicrobial interventions, which uh, CCA and, and Canada Beef uh, have been working on for some time as well. Um, we're, one of our challenges for our members is, is uh, access to the the GEP free cattle that uh, that are required for that market, um, and we've also been working on recently uh, the recognition of exclusion of veal calves from that program because they don't use growth enhancement products uh, in veal. So we're we're just about finalizing a protocol that'll allow that. Um, the other three key po key markets that our members are interested in is uh, Indonesia. Um, OTM beef and offal is, a, is an important next step for that market, OTM beef in Taiwan and uh, OTM beef in South Korea. So these are not, as I said, not the only market issues that we have because I have uh, many members that have different uh, access issues that we work on from time to time, be it uh, horse meat to Korea or bison to Japan or, or ground beef to Japan. Uh, there's many different issues that come up that are particular to a specific uh, company uh, or, or group of companies and that we work on whatever, whenever that comes up. But as a, as a pri list of priorities, that's, uh, that's what we have identified at this time. In addition, there are a number of regulatory priorities that, that uh, we, we've been working on and the recognition of Canada as uh, OIE negligible risk for BSE is one of the most important ones that, uh, that we're looking to achieve. Um, CCA has submitted the application for that and uh, once we get that recognition that's going to open up a lot of doors and that's going to uh, remove a lot of the of the barriers that we've been f facing and and because we've been living under the shadow of BSE for some time now and this is going to help a lot. So we're also actively collaborating with uh, with CFIA to to get the support that they need for technical resources. They they have um, a shortage of staff that they that, that are able to work on some of our issues and and so we end up with a challenge on that in that in that uh, 
uh, we get told that we can only work on certain issues based on what the priorities are or what their what their ability are to work on this this issue. So uh, CFIE needs more people. They need more technical staff, and we've been trying to collaborate with them to try and get them get them more uh, get the government to recognize that and provide more staff. Um, the other issues that that they that they need that would be helpful, of course, is things like. Um, digitization and e-certificates and that type of thing. Those those would really make things move a lot smoother and avoid any errors in, in writing out certificates and that type of thing. COVID, of course, has been something that uh, we've all been working on. Uh, we, we can't avoid it. Uh, we've had very good cooperation with CFIA and Agriculture Canada. Uh, pretty much daily contact on that. Everybody's trying to do their best to to, to to work through this. Um, it's challenging for industry and they and everyone recognizes that whatever one company does or does not do could affect the rest of the industry and, and potential any any other commodities as well. So we have an ongoing going dialogue with CFIA on that and, uh, and uh, other parts of government as necessary but we've worked with uh, um, with all these folks that are on this call today um, everybody's been working together to try and make this move, move as smoothly as, as it can. But uh, those are the key issues that we've been working on and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thanks, Kim, for your update. We will now move to Brady, uh, Manager of Policy and Programs at CCA for his update. Yeah, thanks, Michelle, and good evening, everyone. Um, as Fawn mentioned earlier, I'm going to speak uh, pretty specifically on our lobby efforts towards uh, the area of business risk management and, and even more in particular on agri-stability reform. So uh, enhancements to that agri-stability program have been a high lobbying priority for, for some time for the beef industry and, and as Fawn mentioned earlier, that's only increased in importance during uh, the pandemic. So. Um, what we've done over the past few months is we really wanted to bring a lot more evidence and data to governments on why reform is needed for cattle producers. And, and what we did was uh, we contracted uh, Myers Norris Penny to conduct a number of models um, of, on agri-stability, uh, showing the impact of some of the, the, the changes that are, um, you know, really putting cattle producers at a, at a disadvantage or um, or inequitable to uh, the cattle industry in general. Um, you know, we've talked about these before, but kind of the main ones are, you know, looking at reference margin limiting on cow-calf operations and payment caps uh, that are more, or more emphasis at the feedlot level, and then uh, parameters such as the compensation rates and, and uh, the, the trigger as well are all conversations we've been having with government. Um, I should mention that Marvin Slingerland from Myers Norse Penny is on the call here tonight. So uh, he's also able, able to help take questions that you may have after this presentation. Um, so in partnership with the Alberta Cattle Feeders, we started with some Western Canadian cow, calf and feedlot models, which I'll briefly walk through here shortly. Um, we've also partnered with the Beef Farmers of Ontario and New Brunswick cattle producers uh, to have MNP develop a number of more models using uh, Eastern um, we're looking at Eastern Canadian beef farms and feedlots and, and uh, we look forward to having those results uh, very soon and expect they'll be available really soon and, and interested in what they're going to, what they're going to show if there's going to be a lot of similarities or, or maybe some differences too. Um, but just some background since go, since the growing forward to, you know, agriculture framework uh, and that's when reference margin limiting was introduced. Many cow calf producers were really put at a disadvantage under agri stability. Um, because, you know, mainly because they have low, lower cost structures. So whether it's they have, you know, sh smaller labor expenses or, or they're producing their own feed, they're just a, a lower um, cost structure uh, um, uh, or, or segment of the industry. Um, so I'm going to show the impact of the reference margin here uh, on the slide that's, that's uh, in front of you, if you can see that. So um, it's a, it's a cow-calf model. Uh, the operation of this particular um, uh, model has 600 cows, 900 forage acres, and 4,000 pasture acres. And the financial statements for the year show just about uh, a little bit over a net break even. 
So on, on the chart that you're seeing, uh, just kind of go over what you're seeing. So the green bar is, is your production for the year, or the operations production. Uh, the orange bar is the allowable costs that uh, are under the program. And the, the brown bar is that non-allowable costs that are under the program. So they're almost even, but not, uh, not quite. Um, and then the red is, you know, the shortfall, the, the money shortfall that uh, this operation is seeing. And, and then where you see the pink bars and the purple bars, those are both agri stability supports. The purple bars are actually negative margin support. So for this particular operation, when they're calculating its reference margin um, using a, an Olympic average, uh, what that equals out to, if you're doing it that way, would be about $500,000 roughly. But uh, due to reference margin limiting, uh, their limited margin under the program is actually about $427,000. So right away, this operation is disadvantaged by, you know, about $75,000 in the reference margin, just simply based on, on you know, being a, a cow-calf operation and having that general cost structure. So when, uh, you know, what they did was they kind of just did product, production drops by 10% uh, increments. And um, with, uh, with the reference margin in place, which is what you're seeing here on the first, uh, the first chart, um, let's just see here. The operation's not gonna receive support until there's, you know, about a 20% reduction in, in their production or at that 80% bar. And even there, you can barely see that, that pink line um, of agri stability support. So you're seeing a bit more at that 30% reduction, um, but it's, it's, you know, not doing a lot to cover those, those red bars or the shortfall. So if you can move to the next slide, Amy. They're perfect. So the next slide is showing when the reference margin limit is actually removed. And as you'll see, you only have to get down to that 90% bar or that 10% um, reduction in, in revenue or production before agri stability is actually going to be kicking in with support. So, um, it, you know, basically with this one change, it's going to really help, you know, the viability of this operation dealing with, uh, you know, a challenging year, whether it be on the expense side or, or on the, the cost side um, of, uh, of, some, of some challenges. So Amy, what might be useful too is just going back and forth just a few times between those two charts, just kind of showing the differences there. So that's status quo right now. And then going back, yeah. And so this is what we're, you know, the change that we're asking for and what kind of impact it would have on this particular operation, but you know, in many cow-calf operations across the country. So yeah, and like, as I said, this, this reference margin limits with it applied, it's really requiring an extensive and, and sometimes devastating drop in your program revenue year before you're gonna receive some support. And that's why the reference margin limit's such a high priority is it's gonna really restore some equity and fairness for the, the cow-calf sector. And um, I think it's pretty evident here just by looking at uh, what it is now versus what uh, kind of support you'd see with that provision removed. So we'll move to the next slide, Amy. And uh, we're gonna look at a feedlot model that's been constructed here by, uh, by Morris Mar Penny. And this feedlot model, uh, or this particular feedlot is greater than 25,000 head. Uh, it also has 1,200 crop acres and 2,600 feed acres. And again, the, the bars, um, they're, they're representing the same figures as the previous model. I think you can kind of see that breakdown at the bottom of the graph. Um, and this model actually is unique because it is a projection of a 2020 financial year and, and does actually reflect the, um, a loss at the 100% uh, production bar. Um, and that's due to this operation um, selling fed cattle during that spring, summer COVID um, caused reduction in, in market prices. And you know, what this is kind of showing is that the overall level of support that agri stability is providing for cattle feeders can be you know, pretty limited, you know, relatively speaking to the, the large scale, scale of business that, that this is with this $3 million payment cap in place, meaning that um, your agri stability payment can't exceed $3 million, three million is the max that, uh, of support that'll be provided. And you know, during times of catastrophic loss, you can really see that this pink and purple are hard, really hard to see on any you know, bar within this chart. Um, and, and it's having a little, very little impact on 
uh, supporting this farm's vi viability. Even you know we're we're talking about big numbers, but uh, it, it's having a little bit little impact on some pretty big losses. So MNP did look at a range of different cap increases, and I put one in here. That's on the next slide, Amy. Um, they're looking anywhere between five and, and $20 million caps. And this one's a $10 million cap increase, which as you can see, does show, um, you know, some improvements in filling in those losses uh, that are having a big impact on the, the viability of that farm. The one thing about the payment cap is it hasn't changed since the early 2000s. While we know that there's been increases in the consumer price index and in, in price, increases in feedlot input, uh, input costs, so we're, you know, I think a message that we're trying to push is to have this address to reflect, you know, today's operating environment, especially uh, to account for times of catastrophic loss. So just to kind of wrap up here and, you know, why are these models helpful and why are we using them? Um, you know, we've had a number of meetings in the past months uh, with, you know, our provincial association or with provincial uh, cattle associations and, and national associations. Um, with federal and provincial governments where we've presented these models along with MNP um, you know showing how the program can be improved uh, for the cattle industry and and you know we wanted to go in there with data with analysis with solutions like this rather than just dismissing the program you know here's some some ways and, and some evidence to back it up of how how they can actually be useful for our industry um, and and what I'd say I guess is the feedback from governments has been uh, you know, fairly positive. They appreciate the industry bringing this analysis to them that supports the industry recommendations. And I, I think overall, we've seen some increased acknowledgement of the issues with the program. So, you know, and, and Fawn talked about this earlier, we, we know that these program changes are going to be discussed and potentially decided upon at the federal provincial territorial ag ministers meeting in November. And uh, what we're, you know, going to continue to do is push on these recommendations, you know, continue to share um, these models and, and, you know, we're going to have more models coming uh, uh, in representing Eastern Canada, as I had mentioned before, um, you know, and, and show how these recommendations are really intended to help the program work better for cattle producers as uh, uh, we go into these decision making type of meetings. So um, you know, again, Marvin with MNP is here to help with some questions that this might have raised uh, for you and, and certainly feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions on something I covered here. Um, but just wanted to, you know, I guess share some of the work that we've, we've done as an industry with, uh, with MNP and, um, you know, how we're using it to hopefully bring some positive change to, um, you know, real central risk management program that's available to the industry. So. I'll stop there. Uh, thank you. And I'll pass it back to you, Michelle. Thanks for your update, Brady. We will now have um, a market update from Brian with Campfax. Brian? Oh, thank you. Good evening, everybody. Uh, just got a few minutes here to try and uh, cover some of these main market uh, highlights, I guess, of what's going on since uh, through the summer. And some good news, I guess, in terms of processing levels. Certainly, I know. Uh, that was the, the key topic at the start of all of this, but um, Amy, I think you can bring up my presentation. Yeah. Um, so I guess just so you can see here how, how drastic we, we, our processing capacity was limited in the spring, but you can see through summer, we've actually, you know, quickly recovered and uh, processing levels pretty much back to pre COVID levels and basically throwing in Saturday shifts. Uh, we're able to actually increase our, our fed slaughter um, certainly the cow markets, maybe the cow markets hanging in there, but, uh, doesn't have the premium it has to the U S. So we've maybe seen a few cows shuffle South and certainly packers here focusing on these fed cattle numbers. If you remember, we were talking at one point, roughly 130,000 cattle backlogged, uh, through the summer here, we've processed over 32,000 head more, um, than, than, than a year ago. And actually even with we just got last week's slaughter numbers. We had another big slaughter where we, last week, uh, we processed uh, about 7,500 more fed cattle than last year. So, you know, you can bump that up to 40,000 head. So we are chewing through that backlog. We figure there's, whether you call it a backlog or not, but we're, there's still about 80 to 90,000 head of cattle. Let's say somewhat not accounted for here through this. Um, 
carcass weights uh, in Canada have started to grow and move above a year ago. So maybe there is, you know, it's not a, a big uh, extreme case right now, but uh, this past week we saw our steer carcass weights jump quite a bit above a year ago and something we've got to monitor as we still got some cattle here to work through through the rest of the third quarter and maybe into the start of the fourth quarter. Uh, on to the next slide. So despite the slaughter price, uh, slaughter volumes increasing, you know, you can see on the left is your, our Alberta fed cattle price. Uh, certainly struggled, you know, we hit some of the lowest prices since 2012, 2013. Uh, here we've been well below a year ago all summer uh, and continue to be uh, um, at a weakness due to, you know, large cattle supplies on the market. Uh, it's not uncommon. We're in the low 130s, uh, you know, again this week, you know, packers are playing that they've They've got ample inventories in front of them uh, with not a lot of upside here in probably the short term over the next month or so would be kind of our estimate. Uh, hopefully we can get some seasonal rallies you can see into the fourth quarter, uh, but that may be limited somewhat. Uh, but on the right hand side, so despite, you know, these, these lower fed cattle prices, feedlot losses are, have been extreme at times through the summer. Um, and early in the spring, I think there was some risk management that had covered some of these uh, losses, but through the summer, it's certainly been a bit of an equity drain on feedlots. But despite that, uh, somewhat surprisingly, calf prices on the right, you can see, you know, the blue line being a year ago, we've, we've been, you know, above a year ago in a, a big part of this uh, market condition. So interestingly enough, uh, feedlots, you know, the futures markets have been you know, projecting some stronger prices into next year, but uh, you know, feedlots and buyers continue to pay up for calves despite these losses. And something we've got to watch heading into fall run: just how long are we going to these price, fed cattle prices going to be depressed, and how much are they going to continue to bid in? You know, basically continuing to kind of gamble and speculate on the market moving forward. So again, but lots of calves just, and it's been a very slow start to the fall run. Yearlings were wrapped up, but again, strong, steady with a year ago. Uh, calves have been slow to come, uh, so the market's lightly tested here go, uh, at, to this point so far in the calf market. On to the next slide. Just a quick chart just showing, you know, over the last few years, Ontario on, the, on Eastern Canada, is, uh, again, their, their production levels have been, you know, hardly impacted through the COVID situation. Their prices went to big premiums to Alberta, and they maintain kind of a slight premium. It's it certainly shrunk, maybe more to a, a historical uh, a range, but uh, again, their, their marketplace there, they've continued to process cattle well and, and maintain a slight premium to Alberta, uh, to Alberta which hasn't been the case uh, very much in the last three or four years. Next. Uh, again, talking about we've got a lot more cattle on feed, as I said, we've got some cattle are backlog. We have, we've got some opportunity to work through this backlog a little quicker here in, the, in this quarter. You can see the spring placements were significantly lower than a year ago through Mar March and April. Uh, that should free up some space here that we can, can work through this backlog. Hence, you know, we can so sort of see the uh, light at the end of the tunnel for the, for the cattle on feed numbers, but we also got to remember we placed a lot less cattle this spring, more cattle went to grass, uh, you know, we, we, we could still see uh, more placements staying uh, above a year ago uh, or approaching that, that fall run. We'll have to see on, on weather conditions and, and, you know, with more feed around, maybe my, some cattle will go into more backgrounding lots than straight to finishing. Next. Uh, kind of talked about this already, just the feedlot losses have, have gone, you know, have been significant at times in April, May. Uh, has maybe narrowed up on the cheaper feeders that were placed earlier this year that has brought some of the break-evens down. But, you know, a lot of these cattle still break even in the 140, 150 range. You know, these are still losing two to $300 uh, on fall placed calves. And that's where the equity drain's occurring. So uh, something that just to watch and, and, and kind of a caution again for the calf market here. Next slide. So two big factors we've seen, we saw huge volatility in, in, in fed cattle prices. You know, they've kind of leveled off, but we've got a couple other uh, factors that are, are um, at play here as well. One being the Canadian dollar, uh, you know, it, it's obviously, obviously took a hit with, with the economic uncertainty earlier in the year, but has been on quite a steep uh, inclining rate. And as you can see, we popped above a year ago here recently. Interesting a lot. Interestingly enough, uh, just this week, we've actually kind of broken that uptrend moving from, you know, 68, 69 cents to all the way back to 76 cents. And now we're back under 75. So 
that's a fairly significant trend change. Well, it's a break in the trend. We will see, you know, in the next week or two, if if uh, the U.S. dollar picks up strength and, and what our Canadian dollar does. But maybe a little bit of a sign of, of uh, a break in this rising Canadian dollar, which which certainly could could help us or would be timely heading into fall run again uh, for that. The other big one, and is a rather a bit of a head scratcher. In terms of these calf prices, uh, you know, we look at feed costs. Two years in a row, we've took, seen drastic or fairly drastic drops in, in barley prices heading into the harvest. Uh, but, you know, again, appear to be short-lived. You know, barley's really spiked back up 1.0 under, just under $200 a ton, around $200 a ton at the very, very low. You know, we're back into that 230 range into the new year, priced into 240. So that's a dollar a bushel kind of a climb. You know, when you talk about a dollar a bushel, that can have almost a 20 cent impact on calf prices, uh, depending where these feed costs fall out. So U.S. corn was being imported again and, and could provide a, ce uh, a ceiling on barley. But on the other hand, as barley prices or corn prices rise, uh, so does barley. So two big factors we're kind of watching uh, and haven't really been positive for the calf run either. So. Uh, just a little, again, further caution on there as to how long these calf prices can stay as high as they are if feedlots continue to lose some, continue these losses. Next slide. So, flipping through this pretty quick, but again, I, you know, key factors we're watching obviously is any supply chain issues and, and second wave things that, you know, as sort of Bob even alluded to at the start here, you know, we don't need that or, or any other, other economic uh, issues. You know, demand implications so far so good. We've seen the major shift, you know, obviously food services suffering as bad as anybody, uh, but the retail markets, you know, wholesale cutout prices have been holding in quite good. Uh, you know, they've obviously been very volatile, but when, you know, we're seeing choice cutout at well over $200 or 215 and this is usually a pretty low or slow demand period and cutouts are still hanging in there. So that's good news. Packing plants are making good profits and have a lot of incentive to, to kill more cattle, which, which we need from that standpoint. Overall, you know, we're starting to see a shrinking North American herd. You know, we certainly don't have enough calves in Canada. That's I think part of the reason we're seeing such strong calf prices. We've seen feedlot expansion. Uh, here in Western Canada, a little bit of packing plant expansion and, you know, we're importing feeders and, and that is supporting our calf market to some extent. Possible weather challenges in the U.S. Uh, you know, we've seen pretty massive herd growth across North America, um, again, which kind of bodes well. As good as demand continues to hang on, if we start talking about lower cattle numbers, probably not next six months or anything like that, but, um, you know, provide some longer term support as export markets continue to, to look strong. Uh, so again, that's a longer term indicator. In the meantime, you know, uh, the US and Canada placed, a, again, significantly less cattle through the spring and summer. There's going to be more feeders placed through likely the rest of this year in North America. That's going to now, you know, we've got a back, we call it a backlog. It's not an imminent number, but we we're going to have larger supplies through fourth quarter. Now these delayed feeder placements could be impacting us into the first half of 2021. Uh, again, you know, we can't afford the supply chain issues. Demand should be there and we can hopefully don't have the shocks to the marketplace, but it, it might kind of restrict our spring market on the fed cattle. And um, as we talk about future strength, you know, ultimately you talk about losses on the feedlot level, feed costs, Canadian dollar. If the futures continue to see some strength, they've improved significantly. They've been close to a, a year ago levels. So hence, that's one of the reasons really calf prices are, are near where they are. Uh, but last year, through the fall run, futures actually rallied. And uh, I'm not sure that's quite in the cards this year to see as much of a rally. And, and again, um, you know, these calf prices right now, some of these feedlots saying the calves you buy today to pencil out look like $100, $150 losses in cases. So will they start taking some of that money out of the calf market, which, you know, again, that equates to 10, 20 or more cents a pound on calf prices. That's kind of at risk. Not to say it's going to happen, but something uh, we've got to see uh, uh, or monitor. And the other one, ample feed to stabilize and grow the Canadian cow herd. We'll see. I'm not sure we're really into a growth mode, but maybe focus on stabilizing here in the next year uh, with more cattle being turned out, better grass, more feed, hopefully a few more heifers stay in the herd. Um, moving forward, but don't see that being in big numbers. Cow slaughter down dramatically as well uh, this year's uh, partly exports. So hopefully we see some stability in the cow herd. 
again, there's certainly some caution, some flags into the calf market as we head into fall run. But again, calves, five weight calves today is still 210 all the way, 230, 240 on a short five weight calf, which again, with all of the uncertainty going on and sort of the challenges through the year, um, reasonably, you know, good prices from what some of the market signals show us. And uh, again, heading into October, November, um, we'll just see how the volumes come in and, and how the futures react here to the placements coming up. So. Those are the key factors I'm watching. I think that's that covers my side off. You can skip to, you know, we've got a mobile I, a site to go to. You want more Canfax info, you can go to our website, canfax.ca. I'll leave it at that as time is tight. Thank you Thank for you your updates, update. Fawn, Fawn, Janice, Janice Kim, Kim, Brady, Brady and, and Ryan. Ryan. Before, Before opening, opening the board of questions, questions, the following industry representatives are also available to take questions. Dennis Laycraft, Executive Vice President of CCA, Michael Young, President of Canada Beef, Michael Latimer, Executive Director of the Canadian Beef Breeds Council, and Brenna Grant, Manager of Canfax Research Services. We also have CCA staff helping to respond to questions by text. Please include your name and province with your questions. Uh, we will now be taking questions. Please type your questions using the Q&A function located at the bottom of your screen. So our first question this evening comes from Bruce and Bruce is from Saskatchewan. It seems like much of today's throne speech was a revisit of previous promises from this government. Rural Brad broadband be, remains a huge issue for the farm and ranch community across the country. And in fact, webinars like this are almost impossible for many of us as we attempt to do business remotely. Is this also on CCA's list of priorities? I'll throw that over to Fawn. Hmm. Yeah, thanks Bruce for the question. Uh, yeah, it is. Uh, and I know it's on um, the cattle feeders as well. Uh, and certainly the broader rural infrastructure uh, as well. So, uh, you know, when we're thinking about things like uh, healthcare or transportation infrastructure or um, the knowledge infrastructure that we need that goes along with broadband uh, internet, um, you know, we talk about that we need to make sure that uh, rural Canada is an attractive place to live and these are important investments to, to be made. So. Uh, yes, it is. Thanks for that, Fawn. Our next question is from Colin. The discussion with the UK with respect to the beef trade have to be more balanced um, than that of the current than that of current CETA. Imports from the EU have increased 250% based on your own trade record published last week. No trade is preferable than an agreement similar to CETA. What exactly is CCA's position in this issue? Yeah, thanks for that um, question, Colin. And um, certainly uh, trade with Europe has, has its challenges. There's, there's no doubt about that. Um, and we've been communicating that with the federal government as well as doing um, you know, work in, in Europe to try and make some progress there. That being said, um, Europe is also uh, a valuable market for us. Um, you know, they have um, some of the highest populations with the highest disposable uh, income, and uh, we see that reflected in what they purchase from Canada. So, uh, the average price of what they of the cuts of beef that they're purchasing from Canada are, you know, fourteen, fifteen. $17 uh, per kilo when we look at um, what we ship into into other countries, um, you know, pulling from memory, I think, you know, the US is around the seven and $8 mark. Um, you know, some Asian countries are around the $9 mark. So when we're cutting up that carcass, it's important for, um, of course, the cut to get into the hands of the people who are most um, willing to, to uh, purchase it. So we see opportunities still in Europe and we have seen even through COVID that it was actually one of our markets that um, continued to grow. Um, but there are challenges there. And I think that Canada and Europe have an opportunity to showcase what good trading partners uh, look like. And that's gonna be important post COVID um, because certainly there are a number of examples um, showing what really bad 
trading partners uh, look like. So I think that Canada and Europe should want to be um, an example of, of what we can look like for the future. This week we did see um, premiers who um, were in place in the provinces uh, when Sina was signed, bringing light to uh, the fact that Canada Canada and Europe need to do better, particularly on the agri-food file. So Jean Chere uh, was um, uh, quite vocal in getting that, that started. So then when we're looking at transitioning over to um, the UK, we certainly know um, that there is opportunity there, um, but that we do need that, that trade relationship uh, to be um, more uh, effective um, than what we currently have uh, with Europe. And we have communicated our concerns um, and uh, the opportunity also that we see within that market. So um, thanks, thanks for that question and I hope I, hope I answered it. Thanks for that response, Vaughn. Our next question is for Bill and I believe that this is likely for Brady. What position will CCA take if the Western provinces are unwilling to go 85% on agro-stability? Yeah, thanks, Bill, for your question. And um, I, I guess what I would say is uh, certainly, you know, you've seen it in the in the news a bit, and how much of it is is posturing and, and negotiating in a federal provincial, you know, decision or agreement. Um, you know, from the Western provinces, saying that it's challenging to make any sort of reforms or enhancements to the program. But uh, I don't think they've closed the door either to. Um, you know, to being, uh, you know, open to making some improvements and some enhancements, you know, at the, at the federal level and at the provincial levels, there's, um, you know, there's ongoing mandates to make improvements to these programs and with the door, you know, not being closed on those, I still think that there's, um, you know, really good opportunity to see some positive change at the, uh, at the November meeting. So I guess I'd say what we're really focusing on is within these next, uh, uh, this next month or two, um, you know, leading up to that meeting, making sure that, um, you know, governments and, and the agriculture departments and at the, you know, at the political MLA, MP level, uh, they're aware of, you know, our recommendations and the analysis that supports the recommendations that we've made such that we went over tonight. And um, I think that's, you know, we're going to really focus on that over, um, you know, as priority one um, when it comes to improving agri stability. Um, and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see I, I, all the agriculture, most, you know, most, if not all agriculture groups are quite aligned on, on um, what changes we're wanting to see. So, um, you know, hopefully we're able to, to get some positive change in November. And, and if not, um, you know, we'll, there, these programs are, are around still and, and there'll be chances to, um, to, you know, to try and make some improvements, uh, um, you know, after November as well, but ho hopefully it's not the case. Hopefully we can get some positive change um, at the next uh, agriculture minister's meeting. Thanks Brady for that response. Our next question is from Barton. How have the viabilities of small stat statured species slash breeds been investigated based on projection related to climate change within the next 10 to 40 years? I can take a stab at that, Michelle. And Thanks, Vaughn. <laughs> um, uh, I suppose, first of all, I'm, you know, I, I'm not actually entirely sure uh, about that specific question, um, but the Beef Cattle Research Council has uh, been investing um, significantly and strategically in um, areas related to environment uh, and the beef industry. And that has shown um, perhaps fruits of, of the labor, because certainly when we're working with the federal government right now, climate change is uh, at the forefront of everybody's, uh, of many people's uh, minds. Um, and so that research, you know, has gotten Canadian beef production. We have 50% of the greenhouse gas footprint of, um, uh, in comparison to beef producers around, around the world. Um, we know how much carbon sequestration um, is going in, into our soils. Um, and then also, you know, on how to find efficiencies, because certainly efficiencies are um, what are attached to us being able to have such, um, such a, a low uh, greenhouse gas footprint. Um, and so certainly work in the genetics field is, is key to, to that. So 
um, if you're wanting a, a really specific example on um, um, specific breeds of cattle, uh, I don't have that, but certainly head over to the Beef Cattle Research Council um, and uh, take a look at the research that they're doing. And then Thanks. Michelle, I see that there's another question yes. there, uh, BSC negligible risk status. Um, and so when Canada might be able to obtain um, BSC um, negligible risk, so uh, the application went into the OIE um, um, this summer and that will be reviewed in May of next year. Um, and so after that is uh, when we would anticipate um, hearing whether Canada has achieved negligible uh, risk status. In terms of what impact that um, will have, have on exports. Um, there are still, Kim has mentioned, uh, you know, the shadow of BSE that continues to hang over us in the form of things such as uh, OTM um, bans into a number of markets or things uh, like our uh, specified risk material requirements uh, for, for removal here in Canada. And so um, we would hope and we would um, be, of course, working with the government to uh, remove some of those, all <laughs> of those uh, remaining um, um, perhaps legacy of, of BSC. Uh, and then also uh, we are currently working on a plan to uh, review the SRM uh, requirements and and uh, that SRM removal makes our um, makes it more financially difficult for our packing industry um, here in Canada compared to our competitors. So I think that there's going to be opportunities uh, on a number of fronts here. Of course, that's dependent on whether we uh, we get it, but certainly the application is uh, was robust. Well, thanks uh, for um, responding to those questions, Fawn. Um, and thank you to um, everyone for all your questions this evening. Before we close tonight's meeting, I'd like to pass it over to Bob for some closing remarks. Can anybody hear me now? We can hear you, Bob. Okay, thank you. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank everybody for showing up. We know it's a busy time of year, but we feel it's it's kind of our duty to keep keep as much information in front of people who are interested in it as we possibly can. And I, I'm going to give a, a little accolade to the CCA which may sound funny, but, but it is kind of nice when something that you've been really trying to work on comes to fruitation. And the CCA staff has put a lot of effort into trying to talk to the right people in the national government, <coughs> in our national government about the benefits of the beef industry to the environment. And by the one comment from the throne, throne speech, maybe it's starting to sink in. It's, I know as Fawn says, the devil's in the details, but at least this is, this is a lot more of a start than we've had before. So I'd just like to thank the CCA staff for, for keeping their, their feet to the fire and, and actually making this come to fruitation, maybe. And with that, in the essence of time, unless anybody has any more questions, I think maybe we can sign off and go back to combining our things. Thanks, um, thanks, Bob, for your closing remarks. Thank you to everyone for ch joining tonight's town hall. Um, there will be a short survey when you exit tonight's meeting. We just ask that you would complete the survey to provide us with important feedback for um, potential future virtual town hall meetings. If you have any follow-up questions or would like to request a recording of the town hall, please email me at mcmullenm at Thank you and stay healthy. Merci et prenez soin de vous.